explode. Lah. Then you have that one quarrel, one argument, and one conversation. You try to fix everything in that one quarrel. I don't want to talk about it because I'm tired. I don't want because I know that if I start talking about this, then it always oh, going to be another two hours. Separation and divorce is becoming increasingly common in our communities. Today, we speak to Hannah Yeo, Malaysia's former Deputy Minister of Women, Family and Community Development, herself married for 13 years with two daughters, and family lawyer Jane Ng, who handles divorce cases, herself married for 15 years with a son and daughter. We're going to borrow some insight from these ladies today on making our marriages work, a challenge that every married couple goes through at least once in their married life. I am your host, Pauline. Welcome to TAW Real Chat, where life's insights are shared. This episode on Making Marriage Work is brought to you by Baba Chuchu, the digital marketing agency that makes you look even better. Hannah and Jane, thank you for being with us today. You've both been married for many, many years now. Is it possible to fall out of love with your husband and to grow that love right back in? I think definitely, yes. When you get married, uh, you are at the height of you know all those beautiful emotions, everything you feel you know beautiful about your wedding, the proposal, the engagement. Uh, but all these will fizzle out one way or another uh, as time goes by. So uh, I will say definitely, yes. For me, it was very challenging because when we got engaged, my husband and I, you know, we didn't really have time to talk about feelings. Uh, we got engaged through a prophecy and for him, it was a vision that was fulfilled. And it's too long to explain the story, but basically it was like a, an arranged marriage by God for us, you know. And, and so um, after we got married, it was really a time of adjustment and traditionally things that you get to know the other person through courtship we didn't have mm-hmm. that privilege and we only got that after we got married yeah that's a beautiful story by the way so ladies you haven't heard of hannah's story read her book um becoming hannah and um mm-hmm. you'll be able to get a take into that story but mm-hmm. hannah when we fall out of love with our husband is it possible to fall back in love you know as, as the years go by I think everything that you invest your time, your energy and your emotions in, that thing will grow. So, you know, if you are spending your time on investing in a a relationship that is not meant to be an adultery, you know, that thing will also grow. So whatever you invest in, uh, you will see fruit in that thing. And so the same, if you fall out of love, if you put back the same amount of attention and energy that you used to put in, I'm, I'm quite certain that that respect, that, that, that feeling of, you know, how you, you admire that person. And when you start focusing on the lovely things about all the strength of that person, then I'm, I'm quite certain that you can fall in love again. I really think that in marriage, uh, whatever you choose to see with your eyes, that thing will be amplified. So if you want to focus on his weakness, you can. And that will be the giant in, the, in, in your marriage, the elephant in your marriage. But if you want to focus on, you know, his good points, how, you know, he is better than a lot of other men, then you, your, your perspective, what you see will change also. Right, right. Beautifully said, you know, in, uh, choosing what you see. Jane, I saw you nodding away. Jane, <laughs> do, you, do you want to jump yeah. in? Yeah, because I just echo it, you know. I mean, marriage takes a lot of work. You don't just fall in love with somebody and then, you know, when the storms come, you fall out of love. I mean, it takes a lot of hard work to cultivate habits, values, uh, shared principles, you know, um, common platforms. So like like what Hannah said, you know, if you're going to focus on something, you might as well focus on the things which are common, things that we can agree on and work from there. Um, you know, in Malaysia, couples therapy is really not very common. I, I think people avoid it. It's like a taboo word, but it's very common in America and Canada and Australia where even couples who don't have marital problems will go for couples therapy just to strengthen whatever is there. Yeah. Mm, yeah, yeah, that's so true. Focusing on what you have in common, focusing on his strengths rather than his flaws. I yeah. guess th- th- that's the thing, all right? There'll be days when you're so in love with your husband and there'll be days when you question yourself, how did we even end up together? So friends <laughs> tuning in, if you've ever had this feeling, comment yes if you can relate to this. Now, Jane, you're a divorce lawyer, a family lawyer. You've handled divorce cases. Uh, uh, do you see that many of that in Malaysia? The divorce rates have always been going up. The data will tell you that. And um, I've noticed that during the pandemic, during the lockdown, uh, the numbers have gone a bit higher. And that I'm, I'm only one lawyer, um, but I can see that the cases have at least doubled. The problems which crop up, I feel, stem a lot from communication, trust, 
not so much the you know things like infidelity or financial troubles right. i'm quite sure all of these are also some of the reasons why the the numbers go up but basically a lot of it boils down to communication right yeah. so what you're saying is infidelity is not the number one as hollywood likes to play it out it's actually communication and, and sort of a misplaced or lack of trust is is that right I think for most common households, infidelity is not something which, I mean, it doesn't happen all the time. I'm sure it does happen, but not all the time. But basically, what breaks the marriage first and foremost is the lack of trust and communication. Mm. In terms of communication, um, I think after some years, perhaps the husband is uh, more emotionally distant or the children come into the picture. Mm -hmm. Hannah, do, do you have any sort of input as to how you know a, a woman tuning in today might might be able to draw from in terms of trying to overcome that with their husband? I think for me personally, in that 13 years, I would say the most challenging time uh, in our marriage would be when the girls were really, you know, toddler and one infant. Uh, when you're managing two children so young uh, and they demand everything they could get from you. And after giving all that energy uh, and attention to the babies, you have nothing left for your spouse. And that's when I think the criticism will come in and you will feel unappreciated. And and then you, you begin to despise each other. You will have some kind of resentment, like you will start thinking you know i am already coping with this 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 is this and you still think that i am not doing good enough i you know no matter what i do is never enough mm -hmm. and when you start having that kind of uh thoughts when you start entertaining that um and and you are trying to figure out the kids and both of you are young parents right you you don't get things correctly to, you don't get things correct the first time and so I think you, you will run out of patience with each other. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's the same for him, the same for me. And, and that's when you can easily just snap. And very easily, I think, when you start focusing on what I am lacking and how my needs are not met, that's when you become very um, disgruntled. You feel very... Uh, yeah, and you just <laughs> feel that I, I am not needed here. I'm not appreciated. Mm -hmm. No matter what I do is strong one. So when that, you have that thought, right? No matter what I do is never enough. No matter what I do is wrong. You mm -hmm. stop trying. And when you stop trying, that's when you give up. Lah, because mm -hmm. I, you know, it just doesn't matter what I do. Uh, and so it is usually not like a sudden drop in interest in each other is a progression, you know. So, you know, a dislike becomes a criticism. A criticism then becomes a resentment. So it will grow. So when you realize something, I think it's important, like Jane said, communication. So the, I think that time out, you know, once a week, check on each other, you know, how are you doing emotionally, you know, are, are we okay? So I think I think those things are important. Uh, but yeah. when you are in during that time, <laughs> it's very it's so hard, hard because yes. every day is the same routine with the kids, yeah. Sure, sure. But just to bring you back a little bit, you know, you mentioned the idea of progression. I think that's very insightful. Um, a little dislike mm. becomes a criticism and then criticism becomes... Um, resentment. Uh, resentment, right? Yeah. yeah. It progresses mm. worse from, from then on. Um, at what point do you think that it will be healthy to sort of raise it? I, I mean, is it like a, a, a formal weekly check-in that you do? Hey, how are you feeling? Or it's just, I'm starting to dislike this. What, what's a good way to communicate? We're, we're sharing from our mistake, yeah. I think you we usually we wait until when things explode, uh, then you have that one quarrel, one argument and one conversation. You try to fix everything in that one quarrel. Uh, but right. I, I think ideally, I, even when you're very busy with the kids, you should try to unwind together at the end of every day, even if it's five, mm -hmm. ten minutes, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. I think that unwinding is it, it's, it's like post-mortem line and office, right? Where yeah. you, you, you just need to debrief. I, yes. I think the same thing is to happen at home at the dinner table. The dinner table, I find it's a bit hard because the kid wants to talk and, you know, it's sort of interrupting. So what we do, uh, my husband and I, is we try to catch up sort of morning walk or jog a couple of times a week. Mm. So I guess it's, it's kind of different. I know friends who actually go on couple dates. Jane, do you go on couple dates? Like Not as I, much I as I want to. <laughs> not as much as I want to. But, you know, I'm hearing all of this and I, I think that, you know, these feelings are, for us is very common because women are more, we are more in touch with our emotions. Like when we are unhappy about something, right? We kind of say it out loud, you know? And the more expectations that we place on our husbands, right, to behave in a certain way, right, mm -hmm. we realize that when he does not behave in that way, then we, we kind of get a bit annoyed, you know, the resentment starts and all these feelings come out, all these negative things. You know, um, for me, it came to a point where I told myself, well, I better not place any expectations so that I won't be disappointed. 
yeah, which is not then healthy. And so all these pent up emotions and all that, at some point, it's just going to explode. And so I took a cue from my marriage counsellor. He was a very good friend of ours. He was our marriage counsellor. And I remember he told us, you know, when you sit down and you're having a quarrel, right? Don't focus on you, the word you, you know? Don't start a conversation. You didn't do this or you. Just don't start the conversation with the you. Start by owning your own feelings. Like, I was upset when this happened. I was upset and um, I was disappointed when this. So you own your own feelings, right? And when your partner who loves you, right, can hear Mm -hmm. that, okay, this is upsetting you, right? I'm very sure that, you know, you could sit down and then work things out. Like, Like, you know, Hannah, we've had countless, I mean, I'm sure every couple has had their quarrels, you know, the big ones, the small ones, but couples who are able to then sit down and have heart-to-heart talks and focus on the solution, right? I can tell you that the quarrel will make you stronger. It will not break you. It will make you stronger. Wives, women listening to this, take hope, take heart. As Jane says, if you're having a difficult moment today while you're listening to this, um, see if you can find a way to talk it out because the disagreement itself doesn't break the marriage, does it? Uh, it? It's the inability to come together and to speak it out and to try to find a resolution to it. Um, but I love what you just shared, owning your own feelings and starting with how I feel versus what you didn't do. That's really mm. powerful. I'm taking notes mm. right away. <laughs> Coming back to couple dates, right? You said yes, couple, couple dates, couple dates. Just now. It's tough. I do know of a lot of friends who actually do it like, <laughs> religiously which is a good thing um, but in today I mean for us because we're so busy yeah, I guess for us it's spending that quiet moments after the kids have gone to sleep yeah for Daniel and myself we, we kind of do that quite a lot after the kids have gone to sleep we just kind of you know just sit around uh, you know and chat about the day um, mm. yeah maybe watch a movie together or maybe just sit inside I mean we've been married for 15 years now you know even if you're just sitting in the room just spending time with each other I think it speaks a million words even though you're not speaking sure yeah. sure mm. I want to come back to something else as well you mentioned you went to see a marriage counsellor and you also mentioned mm. before that it's not very common in Malaysia uh, you know it's a lot it's, it's done a lot in US and, and other countries can you give us a bit of insight what actually happens in it sounds very scary marriage counselling what, what, what does it entail <laughs> Okay, for us, because we got married in the church, so it was mandatory for us to go through uh, marriage counseling before you actually have the wedding. And because I was outstationed, so uh, we, we, were in our, we were on a seven-year long-distance relationship before we got married. And so we had to squeeze in the marriage counseling whenever I was in Penang. You know, and I really cherish those um, sessions with our pastor because at every session, he would give us activities to do and the activities that will help us to be able to identify, okay, what are our, what is my strength? What's his strength? What's his right. weakness? What's my weakness? Kind of like the personality test. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then he'll assign us books to read. Uh, where, what are the boundaries in marriage? How do you overcome conflict? Mm-hmm. Um, dealing with in-laws. So at every session, we had six sessions was dealing with a very important topic uh, related to marriage, which I found very helpful and I still practice them till today. So marriage counselling is definitely a must, I think, for all couples who want to get married. Yeah, I want to add to that. Uh, sure. So all of us, we went through premarital counselling before mm. marriage, but mm. that is just really like the, the requirement for the wedding, uh, just so that you, you go in with your eyes open. Uh, but, you know, you are then tested once you have married, uh, whatever lessons that you have learned, how are you going to apply that? And along the way, that's when I think lessons will become experience that you will need application and you need actually another couple to journey with you. So uh, my husband and I, when we went through, you know, that the, the very difficult period uh, when we learned during the premarital course and then we were then, we became teachers to other, com- uh, to other couples. But when you hit a rough patch uh, in your own marriage, right? You have already tried out everything. You have taught people, you have learned, but it still doesn't work. Uh, that's when I think you really need to call in help. And we are so glad that we actually have a, an older couple. You know, you don't have to go to a marriage professional because not, not everybody has access to that. But what, what we, I want to say is it's important to look for somebody who's been married longer than you and, and to just take time to listen to their views, share it out so that you don't carry that burden, just both of you, you know, because I think that the load is quite heavy, uh, especially when you uh, have a problem concerning each other and you try to make the person understand, but the person just wouldn't. Uh, and then mm-hmm. you need the, the other perspective to come in, you know, another couple that can help you see things from a different view. 
so that was very useful for us. So we also benefited from such counseling, peer counseling, I would say. Right. Mm. And how often would you recommend this peer counseling, or as and when you actually have an an issue that you you find it hard to communicate about, or it's something that has to be done sort of regularly? I think in church, uh, it's easier for us to find that kind of support because we have connect groups, we have groups, smaller groups that we do live together once a week. We we touch base, but I understand that not every person will have that kind of access, mm-hmm. and and that's mm-hmm. why I feel that something like that needs to be done out of a genuine friendship. That means uh, both of you must agree to see this couple. Both of you must feel comfortable to talk about this with this couple, uh, mm-hmm. because only out of that respect you will you will treasure and you want to apply their advice. Uh, but if you know if there's one person who is not agreeable, uh, that is very difficult. So you got to make sure that even to enter into that counseling process, both of you are comfortable. If you can't find somebody, you know, keep looking mm-hmm. until you find somebody that both of you are comfortable with. Mm. Mm. You see what what you were saying, Hannah, with, with people who are um, struggling, couples that are struggling, and there are things that you are quite unhappy about, but you can't see eye to eye on it. And as women, there's always something we want to change of our husbands, right? There yeah. is always something. Um, but it seems like when we actually want our husbands to change, they feel like they're having their persona invaded in some way. How do we actually bring up, you know, would you suggest bringing up, starting, even starting that conversation saying, hey, you know what, I think we're having issues here. I think there's some women who might be more outspoken, but some who struggle to even raise that there is a problem. We Let's see somebody. Do you have any tips for that? So I'm I'm at you know I I'm at the other of the of the opposite end right every time there's a quarrel is because I didn't do something uh, so uh, my my husband uh, he he's quite orderly and he gets things done and and he has better ex- greater expectation of me uh, so I'm totally opposite from Jane uh, so Jane wants to talk about her feelings right I actually shy away so I, I think the frustration is I don't want to talk about it because I'm tired I don't want because I know that if I start talking about this then it oh, it's going to be another two hours so uh, <laughs> I, I end up just I just keep quiet lah. I just keep everything inside mm-hmm. so that's also not healthy um, and for me I'm at the receiving end lah, because I am you know the husband that you you all want to tell you know your, your weakness how you want to improve right <laughs> so I'm the wife who constantly needs improvement uh, so I actually can see from the other perspective why you know why so I can understand sometimes when my, my girlfriends tell me you know it's so hard to get your husband to talk in a quarrel the, the husband just want to keep quiet I, I am that husband uh, who will just keep quiet <laughs> keep quiet so I, I, I think um, is uh, you got to find a way uh, to raise an issue without making the person immediately feeling defensive so I think what Jane has shared earlier is a very mm-hmm. good formula to, to not mention the word you first uh, and mm. to help validate what you are feeling inside. Uh, so I think that's a good starting point. Uh, because for me, when an issue is raised about what I have not done, the moment I hear that issue, right, immediately I jump into defensive mode. I just mm. feel that, oh, you're being critical about me again. Uh, so that shut down. Correct. I, I, I just feel that, you know, no matter what I do, it's never enough. Uh, so so you I, I, I can understand how husbands feel like, yeah. you know, it's mm-hmm. everything about constantly about what I have to change, you know. Uh, mm-hmm. So after a while, if you are constantly criticized, you, you just give up trying sure. to change that. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I mean, nobody likes to be attacked. You know what I mean? I think Definitely. whether you're a man or whether you're a woman, right? Yeah. Nobody likes to be attacked mm. and say that, oh, because you didn't do this and so you've got to change. I think it's 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 a very human thing. Nobody likes to have to confront our own weaknesses. But at some point, I think we have to find that right time. And I think this is so important because I think couples sometimes when you don't choose the right time to have these kind of conversations, it may just end up with the opposite effect. So I think choosing the right time to have honest conversations is very important. How you start these conversations, um, what you say about it, and and to have the ultimate aim in mind. I don't think it's right to change anybody. Mm. You know, I think everybody has a right to to feel the way he does or she does and to to react a certain way. I mean, all of us ha- are entitled to have our own responses. We Nobody should tell you that you should not respond in, in such a way. Mm. You know, so you, you, it's that mutual mm. respect that you must have. Give each other that kind of space. Be honest, talk about it, and mm. let's move towards something that we can agree on. Yeah, you mentioned uh, you know hitting a right time. When's yeah. when's the right time? When's the good time? Oh, I usually fix an appointment. 
<laughs> an appointment, like in a Google yeah, no, calendar I, I, sort of I appointment. Will, I will say that, hey, you know, hey, that this thing has happened, and um, it, let's talk about it. Uh, when's a good time? So I'm respecting right. the fact that okay, we're going to talk about something important. Um, may yep. not be now, but so you tell me when's a good time, and then we'll plan towards that. Like I think it helps uh, when you make an appointment. That's so mature. I I need to take yeah. the tip again. <laughs> I I have learned to talk about it when he's angry, and I've learned to talk about it when he's in a good mood. So for me, I think <laughs> you just have to choose. What works best for you as a couple? I have learned mm. that you know talking to him when he's in a good mood when it is is definitely better because then the yeah. anger, the mm. you know the upset feeling is not there. So you the you don't you don't you don't spend all your energy fighting a battle that trying yeah. to remove something that has is already there. You know, mm. yeah, yeah, yeah. And communication is not just. I mean, I noticed this about men. Uh, they don't talk a lot in general. You know, and if he's been at work the whole day talking, mm. he's finished his quota for the day and then you say hey come let's talk about this you know I mean that's not getting it at the right time lah. so I mean be creative lah. you know sometimes I I mean I know Daniel is a very tech kind of guy very into communication so sometimes I just send a text you right. know and throughout the day we are talking about the problem we are talking about mm-hmm. the trouble um, through text mm-hmm. right Right. But at the end of the day, you realize that hey, we, we are getting somewhere, you know. So That's don't great. care lah how the communication happens, mm. even if it's not face to face, uh, yep. oral kind, right? It could be in other ways, uh. Ladies, if you are listening, tell us how do you actually communicate with your husbands um to resolve a certain disagreement that you might have? Do you do it um by speaking in person, text, or even by email? Drop us a comment below. Jane, when you say yeah, husbands don't like to talk, um, I, I'm thinking of what Hannah. She said she doesn't like to talk. So next time, you know, when I'm having yeah. an argument and trying to get my husband to speak, I will see Hannah's face on my husband. Yeah. <laughs> um, but let, let's go a little bit deeper here. I think there's something else that that Hannah said about you know when she comes home and she's really tired. And I think it's a th- it's a team that Hannah has also touched in some of the interviews that she's given. Um, do either of you struggle with this, especially with the mobile phone? I mean, every everything's beeping away, and you're trying to spend yeah. some quality of your time, right? How, how do you just switch off the mobile phone? We you know it's, it's very difficult because sometimes when I'm busy, he's free, and sometimes when he's busy, I'm free. So I, I, I think one thing that couples have really learned as you grow older is that you, your expectation of each other will change. Lah, it's not that we expect less now, but we are more realistic. And for me, it really doesn't matter how much time you're spending on your phone, as long as you know, like I say, if we can unwind together, you what mm. you treasure, what you cherish, you can still have it then it really doesn't matter because sometimes our work and his work you know is we, we are on whatsapp right there are days that i need to re- respond these two hours i need to i need to get on the call i need to be on zoom that i just have to do it and so we i think we have learned to adjust and i think the lockdown has really helped like, all of us to adjust to this new mm, flexibility normal. work from home kind of thing yeah we we not only have the mobile phones and work to distract us we've got children parents in laws <laughs> and i suppose less of friends now given uh, uh with the pandemic and the restrictions we see less of our own friends which comes first as, as, as women? The children? Your aging parents? I mean, filial duty calls or the husband? <laughs> Always the children. Uh, simply because yeah. I believe that children are vulnerable and that children yeah. need us more. Uh, and our mm. spouse, not, not to say that they're not important to our parents, but because they're adults and they, they have to a certain extent be able to carry such other roles you know on their own but children cannot they are 100% dependent on us and that's why I think for both of us we have that common understanding that uh, the children take first place which is yeah. there's no there's no right or wrong formula there are other people who would definitely consider their spouse more important uh, but you know for us just the kids yeah yeah, yeah, it's the same for us in our household. Um, Daniel and I kind of decided that because you know we're very heavily involved in our work as well as in our you know other activities, and so we we have come to an agreement that if if one has to travel, the other has to stay home. So we rarely are both out for business trips or for ministry trips or whatever it is. You know, one of us tries to stay home uh, as much as possible. Yeah. To be with the kids in terms of communication breakdown and things like that, it it sort of worsens. I think as you with a few years that go by and and your goal post or your your life goals sort of evolve with time, and you're not evolving yeah. together as a couple. 
So mm. one might be heading towards a slightly, veering off a slightly different direction, maybe in terms of um, where they want to live or what they want to achieve and, and things like that. But, and, and Hannah, I've, I've heard your interviews of yourself, your story where you mentioned you, uh, you know, at one time you had to step back and, and Ram was working and then you, you, you guys complimented that each other as well. H- how can couples work towards that, you know, and, and sort of taking turns to support one another in their goals? I think it's not about what you do, but what you decide together. I think the decision-making process is the crucial part. Uh, Don't decide on your own uh, because that's when the other person feels not respected. So Mm -hmm. it's not important who does what, but make that joint decision together. So Mm -hmm. every time we need to make a critical decision, we come together and we decide, you know, do you do this or I do this now? So regardless of the outcome, it is a joint decision. When it's a joint decision, you've got to own the decision no matter how bad the outcome is. Uh, so mm. the blame game will not be there if it's a joint decision. Uh, we don't make, don't make the mistake of I decide and then I tell you, I communicate to you and then you are expected mm. to follow. I think that's when the other person feel, you know, you don't respect my space. You don't think about my dreams, my ideal mm. um, and, and my plans. Yeah, so I, th- I think plans can always change and we have learned that in 13 years of marriage, right? There are seasons where you give, there are seasons that you receive uh, as a spouse. Uh, and so for us, we play that role uh, sometimes we reverse that role but in every decision I think it's important to own it together mm. what if you're both sitting at the table and you still can't agree I mean surely that happens is it just a matter of drawing lots at that point of playing scissors paper rock I, I think that's when if you still cannot find an agreement right you don't rush mm. into that thing uh, obviously if you cannot find an agreement for something as important I'm not talking about are we going to have Indian uh, food for dinner or not <laughs> you're talking about some very serious sure, uh, decision and if you cannot find uh, agreement obviously something is still you're not quite there and, and so forcing it is not going to get any outcome uh, so mm-hmm. it's important to take time to go through this kind of thing and, and you know not every decision you will have an agreement uh. So you, some, you have to agree to disagree. I think I think you feel a lot happier. Don't try to force the other person to agree. Yeah. There's no point he says yes, but you know inside he resents the decision. So mm-hmm. take take time. Don't rush into decisions like that. If you still cannot find agreement, take time to pray and 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 continue to wait until it's the right time or when the right thing comes up. Mm-hmm. And and on that point, I don't know Jane or, or Hannah, you you you've seen this among uh, among your own circle of friends where the mother is expected to you know take on those few roles at home in terms of chores and and um being very hands on with the kids and yet they're still bringing the bread home right so we're we're all working mother this year and and yet typically in an Asian household the man sort of walks in and he 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 just brings home the bread and he doesn't have to help out much at home how can we encourage our husbands to <laughs> ease the wife's burden in these matters because I'm sure division of household labor is one of the uh, a common area of conflict as well for many couples I, I'm blessed with a husband who puts things in order uh, more you know he's, he's, he's more orderly than me and so uh, I, I don't have that problem so I actually don't know how to how to encourage a man to do housework I don't have that problem so maybe Jane I don't know <laughs> Jane <laughs> I don't, I have a very good support system, you know. So so I, I I so Daniel doesn't have to really do a lot of housework and and yeah, the opposite of Hannah. Actually Daniel is also a very orderly person. Um of course our personalities are very different. Um he likes to do things on the fly, you know. He could just like, hey come, let's go for a picnic now or let's go swimming, you know, go for a beach trip. And he could just, yeah, like pack up quick go let's go you know but I'm my personality is so different you know I I kind of need to plan things on you don't tell me last minute you want to go out you know I will just go crazy you know I mean I won't I won't explode or shout or anything but it it mentally it does something to me it stresses me out no end you know because I have to plan a day ahead so Mm. I I normally like to say okay tomorrow what are you going to do this weekend what are we doing you know I kind of like to know things um, ahead of time lah let me put it in from a different angle then. There are, you know, there are in some cases, I think, where we talk about bringing home the bread, the wives are earning more than the husbands, right? And it, it, it becomes another source of conflict within um, marriage as well. Do you see that among the divorce cases that you do, Jane? I think that the expectations that we place on ourselves as women um, is quite unnecessary because mm. the laws have not changed. The law still mandates that the man provides for 
the wife and uh, provides for the children. I mean, at the end of the day, I wish more women knew that, that it is actually the legal duty of a man to provide for his wife and children. Right. Okay. So when a woman works, right, she contributes to the household on her own accord, mm -hmm. but that does not take away the legal duty of a man to provide for his wife. Having said that, you know, I, I, I realize that a lot of women are now either equally on par with their partners mm -hmm. or, mm -hmm. or maybe one does better than the other. Regardless, mm -hmm. I think when it comes to contributing to the household, we shouldn't say that, okay, this is this is the man's job to provide, you know, for education, for health or whatever. And then the woman uh, does the rest, you know, the cleaning, the cooking and all that. I mean, we live in a day and age where couples can share responsibilities, lah, you know. Couples can talk about, about doing house chores, you know, there's nothing wrong with it. I, I do know of friends where their husbands are actually the house husbands, mm -hmm. you know, and, and they're very happy because if that is the strength of your husband to uh, take care of the kids well and, and to do the more domestic. If mm. that's his strength, let him right. do it. So we're not all the same. I think we cannot say that all households are the same. No, because I think it depends on the strength and the witness of, of the couple. I think marriage is about contribution, right? By both parties. Mm. So don't always just look at financial contribution, mm -hmm. but you know, look at what are we both bringing to the table. And mm -hmm. so this is something we learned at, during the premarital course, you know, try not to say I own this and you own that. I earn this and you earn that. So, you know, it's, it's one account for us. Um, of, co of course, we have other accounts, but I'm saying that, you know, we, we bring everything to the table together and we share it together. So uh, I, I know that other couples uh, may struggle with something like this, uh, mm -hmm. but that's when I think you don't let society's uh, expectations be set on you, you know, that just because others are doing this outside, you know, I, I want this too, but the other husband may not allow you to go and work like, mm. like the kind of freedom you have here. So every marriage is different and every marriage has its own strength. So that's why I say you need, you need to focus on what is good and celebrate the good in your marriage. Because if you start mm. comparing, there will mm -hmm. always be somebody who's bringing more money home. There will always be a better husband. There will always be, you know, a more understanding spouse. Uh, and, mm. and so if you start comparing, that's when trouble comes in. La. Yeah, don't, mm. don't look at what mm. others are having and what you are not. Sure. Very, very good advice there. You know, speaking of joint accounts, there was actually an article published a couple of days ago in a UK paper. And apparently, there was some study that said um, couples with a joint bank account tend to do better and less likely to divorce. Um, but there's always this issue where one, one likes to save and one likes to spend. Sometimes it's the man, sometimes it's the woman. I don't think it's gender specific. Um, how, how can we navigate around that? Is it just about sitting down and talking? Because some of these spending habits, I think they, they, it comes from your respective families and values. So it can be quite different. Jane? Yeah. Actually, one of the topics that we did at uh, our pre-mental counseling was on financial management. There's no right and wrong answer to whether couples should maintain joint accounts or whether we should maintain separate accounts. There's no right or wrong answer. Um, for couples who maintain joint accounts, I think it's, it's, it's a good thing if we are all committed to the same kind of budget, the same kind of finances, the same kind of standards of sleep standard of living that we want to provide for our kids. I think that works out. But for uh, many of us, uh, especially for us career women, we want to maintain our own financial freedom uh, to some extent. You know, um, whatever I earn, right? I don't need to declare except to income tax, you know what I mean? So to speak. Uh. But when you're a working woman and you maintain your own bank account, I think there is a certain uh, freedom there. It, it, it also does something to your self-esteem. And basically, it makes you feel better. When you feel better about yourself, you can be a better spouse. You can be a better mother, you know, because you are taking good care of yourself first. The law has moved on to recognize even contributions by housewives. So say if you're a housewife, you don't earn an income, right? Mm -hmm. That does not make you a lesser person in the marriage because your contribution is then valued and seen in the way you raise your child, the way you keep your house clean and tidy um, so that your husband can go out to work and, and he comes home to a clean house with food on the table and the children are, you know, well taken care of. The law already has begun to recognize that and that's why I think uh, recently in the papers um, it, it 
I mean, the government did announce that certain percentage from your EPF, uh, from the husband's EPF, can also then yeah. be given to mm-hmm. the wife. Yeah. yeah. So that's the ISURI uh, program that we launched when we were in government. It's, it's a recognition that the government mm-hmm. places on housewives, you know, the fact that you are doing work at home, you contribute. That's the informal sector. So it's a recognition by the government to say, you know, if you put in this amount of savings, we will then match it and top it up so that you, we recognize your contribution. What you do has value, not just for your family, but for the nation. So that changes how people see housewife, you see. Fabulous. Fantastic initiative. I, I hope it's just a start of um, even better initiatives to come. Uh, what I'm what I'm hearing throughout today is that it's about having a common understanding, having alignment, and and whatever that's shared here today isn't a one size a, a one solution fit for all sizes kind of thing. We have to personalize the solution to every marriage, finding our own strengths, and mm. having that communication lines open. I mean, it's been really really insightful. But let's let's touch on one last thing before we call it a day. Um, the the topic of sex. How important is sex in marriage? And it isn't isn't much spoken, I think, in in most um conversations in Asia. Is sex important? Of course, for Asians, I think we we learn as we go, right? We, I mean, we're so shy to uh, talk to it to with friends or you know to to definitely cannot talk to our parents la, about sex. Uh, <laughs> so, so you you talk to each other about it, and I think I think you we now with Google, you can actually read up about you know other other people's challenges and I I think you 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 learn as you go uh really is so different from you know what you imagine in in movies right it is is different mm. um but we we have learned now that um in in 13 years you know not all the time you feel sexy or you know you you you, you definitely don't feel like that all the time uh mm-hmm. but it is sex is very very powerful uh to bring uh, as a reconciliation uh tool I, I would say uh, where you know you you build on intimacy again um, mm. so I, I would definitely say that it has become like a gift you know uh, in a marriage especially when when you quarrel and when you are hurting uh, it's mm. it really helps you express that kind of love for each other that you know words words cannot do it yeah. yes right mm. yeah 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 Jane you have anything else to add to that no, I totally agree. <laughs> Support whatever Hannah has said. You know, it's a very powerful tool for intimacy. Um, or it, you know, it may change. I mean, I, I dare say that that um, you know, after kids, um, you know, a woman's body changes. It's it's not the same as when you were, you know, twenty something. But really, sex is not about how you look or, or how your body looks. I think it's much deeper than that. It is a sharing of oneness. Uh, closeness, um, you know, with somebody that you love and somebody that God has prepared for you. So it's more than just something that is physical. So I think for a lot of women who who feel a bit different, you know, after so many kids or like, you know, my body shape's not not the same. Um, mm-hmm. you, yeah, intimacy is much more than just something physical. It's something spiritual. It's emotional. Yeah. Be- beautifully summed up. I mean, so women, um, you know, it's about having that confidence, isn't it? from what yeah. you're saying that no matter how your body has changed um, and it is powerful and it's something that we should um, continue to, to cultivate in our, our respective marriages but in some marriages it just doesn't work the talking it's not going anywhere at what point would you think a woman needs to call it a day at what point do we keep pushing or do we just sort of say hey you know what it's just really not working out Jane? Yeah I would say that you know, for women who are abused uh, by your spouse, uh, whether it's a physical abuse or it's an emotional abuse, I think no woman should have to go through that. Um, you you need to decide at some point of time enough is enough. I shall I I I refuse to be bullied by my spouse. Um, and especially if you know there is a uh, physical or there is emotional abuse, I think it's it's time to seek help. Either you seek help or you you have to come out and probably consider calling it quits for your marriage. Yeah, mm. I have seen uh, a lot of children uh, being you know at the receiving end uh, being victims of 
bad marriage or unhappy marriage and in a bitter divorce. So I would say that, you know, in the best interest of the child, uh, both couples, even if you decide to go separate ways, also seek counselling and seek, you know, others' opinion before you decide on that. Uh, because you think that you have come to the end of yourself, but actually, you know, it may not be that bad. So always get external support and external help. But I have also definitely learned not to judge people who opt for divorce simply because like we say it, it is a partnership and we don't know what the couple goes through you know and, and we don't know how much they have tried uh but it's it's not working and so um i i have really learned not to judge people and that you know both couple i mean both husband and wife must decide what is the best decision it, it, it's very important that when you sign the papers when you consider a divorce it really doesn't stop with you signing the papers, uh, the children carry with them for the rest of their lives. And so these are considerations. Uh, these are things that you you will probably have to think twice after listening to other uh, couples mm. uh, or other children who are at the receiving end. So definitely, I think, take time to consider your options, talk to, seek counselling, seek help, uh, know your options. Uh, but if there is violence involved, uh, if there's domestic violence, definitely you are entitled under the law to get help legally here. Right. So, so seek help, seek counselling. Um, you want to make sure that it's just not you're just not at the end of you that there's really nothing else left before you take that next step. Now, Jane, you you handle divorce cases, and while we have you here, for women who are really at that point where they need to to call it a day, what are some of the first steps that she should be taking? Okay, first, if, if you are confronted with a situation where physical abuse, ah, we're talking about mm -hmm. domestic violence happens mm -hmm. in your household, you need to report it to the authorities. You need to seek legal help. Try to get an uh, interim protection order for yourself, for your children. So remove yourself from the house. You know, get legal help. File the necessary papers in court. Um, nowadays, you can get it done quite quickly with uh, electronic filing. Get the interim protection order or what we call a restraining order. Protect yourself and the children first. Right. Yeah. But what if there's no domestic violence and it's just a matter of um, no longer being able to see eye to eye and it, it, there is just, it's, it's not a partnership anymore. So both parties are not willing or committed to working it out and, and yeah. they really have to call it quits. What should a woman do? Is it, is it was the first step to, to just see a family lawyer or how, how does it work? I mean, it depends on the degree of neglect that is happening, I think, uh, in the household. Because if, if the husband is already not providing uh, physically, I mean, financially for the family, if, mm -hmm. if the husband is neglecting his duties uh, to, the, uh, to the wife and as well as to the children, if the husband is basically turning cold, uh, you know, you're not responding anymore to any form of help, then I think it's time to, to step out of that situation and then seek help from outside already. I'm, I'm, I'm speaking to all women who suffer in silence who are actually going through some kind of emotional uh, uh, abuse actually because if somebody does not talk to you for five years right and you you are left to kind of still function like a normal human being take care of the children clean the house and all that but your husband does not speak to you your husband comes home and he's cold and he's indifferent and he doesn't care about how you feel about certain things and then i think over the years this will count as an, some kind of emotional abuse already you need to come out of that um, don't don't wallow in self pity. You know, don't take it anymore. You know, seek help. Go find legal help. Yeah, and, and just be brave enough to confront the situation. Don't suffer in silence. Have you seen cases like that? Because you speak with such conviction. Have you seen the you know s um, situations like that in in your work? I have, yeah. So in the course of my work, I've seen a lot of women with a lot of issues. And like Hannah says, you know, I, I don't judge them. I just listen and every circumstance is not the same. But um, it's quite common, I feel, that men don't like to talk about their feelings. And, and so when, when they come home, right, they just kind of clam up. You know, that does not help if you can't right. even communicate or have one or two conversations in the day. You sure. know, you really have to re-examine your relationship if, if you're not talking anymore. And in that situation, what you're saying is just get legal help. Does the woman have to take any stand for a lawyer? Is, are there any practical tips that you know she does to prepare? 
Yeah, that's the beauty of social media actually because if you have a question and if you don't even know where to look for help, right, you could just join any group. You know, I mean, the Asian woman is one good place to kind of just sound out and does anyone know of any family lawyer or you could go to, I know in Penang, we have the Penang Mummies Discussion Group where all sorts of questions, all sorts of, you know, pleas and cries for help come out. Um, yeah, so make use of that. What would be your th- top two things to say to all Asian women today? If you had to distill it to two things, two tips for them to take away from today. Hannah? My first one is, uh, you know, if you have problems in your marriage, never feel alone. Every single couple goes through it. And especially if you're just looking on Instagram and social media, you start comparing and you think everybody else is enjoying and having a perfect marriage, then you are you can be mm. so wrong. Um, mm. So if you are having problems in your marriage, that is normal. Uh, but you just need to be able to get help and, and talk through it. Now, number two is we go through seasons in our life. So if you're going through a very tough or rough patch, it's not going to be like this forever. Um, mm. and, and there will be easier times uh, so it's really about lasting the race together. Yeah. Mm. Wonderful. Jane? Um, what would be your okay, top two tips? Top two tips. Uh, first tip is that you're always a team. Always think together as a team. You know, you're not mm-hmm. just individuals by yourselves. You're always a team. You're a partnership. So whether you are dealing with parenting or in-laws or, or uh, you know, resolving conflicts or some kind of financial trouble, always think together as a team. And, we, and, and you know, team effort will, will help you to overcome, you know, storms in life and all of that. Um, the second one is communication. You know, I, I shared earlier that Daniel and I, uh, we had a long distance relationship for seven years before we actually, mm. you know, finally tied the knot. And I could tell you it's not easy, you know, being long distance and all that. And the thing that has really sealed it for us is that our communication has always been solid. Um, yeah, we speak freely um, and we share our opinions. Uh, we don't always agree on the same things. Like what Hannah said, you know, we sometimes have to agree to disagree, like, especially where parenting is concerned, you know. Mm. Um, we each have our own styles, but, you know, that mutual respect, the talking about what works uh, for him, what works for me, what our strengths, what our weaknesses are, that has really sealed it for us to have mm. this marriage work. Wow. So communication right? And teamwork. And teamwork. Teamwork. And Hannah's top two tips, uh, you're not alone. And um, the bad times uh, will also come to an end. It's not going to be yes. like this forever. It's, it won't last. Bad times don't last forever. The sun will rise again. <laughs> yeah. That's all the time we have for today, folks. Hannah and Jane, thank you so much for joining us today. And friends, tell us below if you agree with what was shared and if you have any other tips on making marriages work. Before you scroll away, give us the thumbs up and share this video with all your girlfriends. Until our next TAW Real Chats episode, stay safe and take care. Bye for now.